please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Stephen Hill. Okay, is this working? Is the mic working? Great. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here with you um, and to be here in Atlanta and to, uh, for this afternoon, have a discussion about really what we're going to be talking about is uh, what's the right development model for the 21st century? Um, you know, a few years ago, we suffered an economic earthquake of about 8.0 on the Richter scale. And uh, we've been seeing aftershocks ever since. You know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen headlines about places like Greece and Portugal, but also in California, where I'm from. California is a state that um, right now is 25 percent of, of Californians don't have any health care. Uh, a lot of Californians have lost their homes. Unemployment is twice what it used to be. It's uh, over 12 percent. Uh, you know, there's, other states are also having a hard time. So we're living in the aftermath of this uh, economic earthquake. And when you think about it, a lot of the rules that we thought had been settled about how you develop an economy, um, you know, how banks are supposed to act, how businesses are supposed to, are supposed to act, how the interaction of government and uh, the private sector is supposed to act, uh, those rules have suddenly been thrown up in the air because, you know, we used to have a mentality in the U.S., uh, the, the, uh, the government is the problem, as President Ronald Reagan said in his first inaugural address. And there was a big move for a couple of decades to deregulate, 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 get government out of the way of business, let business um, you know, go to work and do what it does, which is create jobs. And that attitude, of course, is still there, and it's an important attitude. It's, uh, but on the other hand, we saw what happened when government just vacates the field when it comes to things like the financial industry um, and when it comes to some of the other areas where uh, business left to its own devices actually crashed the economy and created the, the worst economic uh, crisis since the Great Depression. So many of the assumptions that we thought had been settled and, uh, and many of the, uh, you know, the thinkers who we thought were leading us in the right way, suddenly it's all up for grabs again. And this is not just true in the United States. It's true around the world because in many ways the development model for emerging democracies was based on what was called the Washington Consensus done in conjunction with other organizations like the, uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. And you know the, 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 the idea there was you're supposed to uh, really um, decrease government costs, decrease regulation, and increase your exports if you're an emerging democracy. Well, now another country has come along, China, that has a, a, a slightly different way of developing an emerging economy. And suddenly that poses another model out there of development that in some ways is a competitor with the American model. And there's an, yet a third model out there, um, and it's what is, is, is basically the subject of my book, Europe's Promise, which is that there is actually a European way of development that is different than the American way, it's different than the Chinese way, it's different than the Japanese way. And so, um, one of my colleagues wrote a book called The Second World, a fellow by the name of Parag Khanna. Uh, and and we, you know, a lot of our conversations around, when he was writing that book fo focused around that there's these um, three power centers in the world today, uh, the US, China, and Europe. And they're the power centers just because their economies are so big. And that the rest of the, the world, in some ways, are what we sometimes talk about in politics as the swing voters. They're the ones that are going to decide which of these development models are most attractive to them. And, um, and as they decide, that development model is going to gain in currency and in prominence in the world. And as we think about these things, what come, becomes very clear um, is that the world is, is facing some immediate uh, challenges that are going to last for, for many decades into the 21st century. And in fact, the, the, the premise of my book is that the world is facing two immense challenges 
that we've never faced before. And they are the following. First, how do we identify the institutions and practices that are going to allow a burgeoning global population of six and a half billion people to enjoy a decent standard of living? Um, another way of saying that is how are we going to allow the Chinas and the Indias and the Brazils to come up in the world and have a seat at the table, which they undeniably deserve? Because they want what we have, right? They want nice auditoriums, nice universities, nice homes, nice streets. That's the middle class life. You know? uh, and so they're all looking to have what we have in America, what they have in Europe, what they have in Japan um, and Australia and other places. So the, but the other challenge becomes how do we allow that kind of development to occur without burning up the planet in a Venus atmosphere of our own creation through excess carbon emissions? And even for those who aren't convinced about global warming, um, there's no, no doubt that as more and more countries try to become, quote, middle class, they're going to be using up more resources. Um, they're going to be using up more water, more uh, steel, more cement. China is already becoming one of the largest users in many of these um, resources. Uh, you know, there's a lot of trace minerals that are used in technology today. Those of you who are tech students know what I'm talking about. A lot of trace minerals that are, are absolutely needed. Um, you don't need them in great quantities, but you need them, and there's not that much of it in the world. So there's going to be competition for these sorts of things. Um, so we have both the development, the economic development challenge, as well as the environmental challenge. And increasingly, these two are going to collide if we don't figure out a development model that is going to allow it all to work. And into this um, discussion, is where my book enters, because in looking at Europe, it actually has developed some important um, institutions and practices that we here in America can learn from, just as they have already, Europe is learning from us all the time. I mean, this is not about who's right and who's wrong and which model is going to beat the others. It's about um, how do we learn from each other in this very global age so that we can develop the best model that other countries, other parts of the world can begin to use coming up with their own local and regional versions of it that makes sense for them. That's really what this is about. And so when you, when you think about um, Europe, uh, I mean, a lot of the uh, American media really has missed the real story of what's going on in Europe. Um, you know, just as the American media missed weapons of mass destruction, right? And they missed an $8 trillion housing bubble. I mean, how do you miss an $8 trillion housing bubble? Um, that's a sizable housing bubble. And many of the economic experts also missed it. So, you know, the media, of course, rely on the experts. If the experts don't get it right, the media doesn't get it right. So just, the, but in a similar way, they're missing the real story of what's going on in Europe. And now you see all the reportage on the pigs, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and, and Spain. And just four countries out of, you know, 30 in Europe uh, or more, depending on how you count Europe. And, um, and in fact, Europe, uh, you know, when you look at a lot of the headlines about Europe over the last 10, 15, 20 years, what you see consistently in American media is they report Europe as this weak, sclerotic economy, strangling in red tape, uh, socialism, um, you know, the, uh, a place where uh, it's dying out, its population is dying out, it's, uh, you know, being overrun by Islam um, immigrants, Muslim immigrants. This is basically the, what you see reported uh, time and time again in the American media. But in fact, Europe is, as Dr. Birchfield said earlier, is the largest economy in the world. It produces nearly a third of the world's gross domestic product, which is the, out, the output of your economy. Um, in fact, Europe's economy is almost as large as the United States and China combined. Think about that. And think about, you know, most people when they hear it, they, they're very surprised. You know, with all the hype we're hearing around the G2, as it's called, America is the current superpower, China is the emerging superpower, and yet Europe has an economy that's almost as large as the two of them combined. Europe has more Fortune 500 companies than the United States and China combined. Europe has, uh, it's the largest trading partner with both the United States and China. If you invested your money in European stock markets up until 2008 when everything crashed, on average, you made more money in European stock markets than you made in the American stock market. Does this sound like socialism? Does this sound like a weak, 
uh, sclerotic economy, as you see the word sclerotic used over and over again? Absolutely not. And in fact, what you realize is that Europe is completely capitalist, uh, just as America is capitalist. But it's a different type of capitalism. And it's what I call in my book social capitalism. And I compare that to what we have in the United States, which I call Wall Street capitalism. And there's a lot of differences between the two, more than I could go into now, but we can certainly talk about during Q&A. Um, but what it boils down to, the difference between them, is that with social capitalism, um, well, you know, th there's no question that capitalism and the corporations that are the major economic uh, actor in capitalism is the greatest wealth generator that humans have ever devised. But there's an outstanding question there. Who gets that wealth? Whose pockets does it go into? And that's where Europe has figured out how to harness this capitalist engine to create a more broadly shared prosperity. Whereas the United States version Wall Street capitalism is still, uh, for the most part, a, a trickle-down type of uh, economy, where much more of the wealth goes into fewer and increasingly fewer pockets. To give you just one um, astounding uh, statistic I saw recently, the um, 400 wealthiest Americans in, during 2010, in a year in which um, another million Americans lost their homes, more jobs were lost. At this point, our economy has lost, has shed 15 million jobs during this economic crisis. Um, in a, a, a year where uh, you know, 50 million Americans still don't have health care, um, and where many of the programs that the, uh, the poorest and, and children and others depend on have been slashed in state after state. In 2010, the 400 wealthiest individuals saw their incomes increase by 10% to the point where those 400 people have a, a total of $1.4 trillion in wealth, which is greater than the entire gross domestic product of the country of India with a billion people. That's the type of uh, inequality that we're talking about. And the inequality is not just a matter of, you know, um, it's not fair, or it's not right, or any moral question. It's a matter of how do you have a functioning macro economy? Because there's all sorts of uh, studies that have been done by economists and others who, who, who are showing that if, if not enough people have enough money in their pockets to buy what's produced in your economy, then you see a drop in consumer spending. Because the businesses now have fewer customers, they have to lay people off. Because people are laid off, now they have less money. They have to buy less, uh, so businesses lay off more people. And you get into this downward spiral, which is what has happened in our economy. And so the, the inequality aspect is not simply a matter of moral, what's right or what's wrong. It's a matter of how do you have a functioning macro economy where what your economy is, produced, is producing is bought by uh, consumers, and, and that maintains jobs, maintains standard of living, maintains cons cons consumption levels. And what we're seeing now, clear trajectories, is that a lot of, even as a lot of the, the banks and the corporations that lost uh, quite a lot during the economic crisis, as they've come back to pre-crisis levels, they're not creating really any jobs. Why is that? Because they are using those resources to go overseas. They're creating jobs overseas. They're not creating jobs here. That's a big problem from the point of view of having uh, I just saw, in fact, in today's um, newspaper, the, the uh, Constitution, Journal Constitution, uh, DeKalb County, um, I think the number was 11% of homes uh, are in foreclosure. And other counties in Georgia is even higher, up to 14%. Not to mention uh, a lot of homes now are what they call underwater, where their, um, the value of their home is now worth less than their mortgage because of the complete drop in, in prices. It's essentially, they're bankrupt and with no end in sight. So this is the type of trickle-down economy that can really hurt your broader macro economy in both the short term, the medium term, as well as the longer term. And that's what the, uh, you know, the Washington consensus has le led to here in the United States. So with, with Europe's um, brand of social capitalism, they have figured out how to create this more broadly shared prosperity. How do they do that? They do it by putting into things like healthcare. Um, things like retirement. They have a much more uh, generous retirement structure in, in, in these countries. Um, things like child care, paid parental leave. After you have a child, you, 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 can, you stay home and you still get your pay. 
uh, paid sick leave. You know, when you're sick, you get to stay home. In the United States, 60 million private sector workers do not have any paid sick leave. So when they get sick, they're forced to make a decision between do I stay home and take care of myself or do I stay home and take care of my children, who's a child who's sick, and lose that income, or do I go to work and infect all my coworkers, right? A lot of these uh, 60 million workers work in the service sector, in restaurants, handling your food when you go to, when you eat there. So next time you go into a restaurant, think to yourself that there may be someone in the kitchen or even your waiter or waitress serving your food who's sick and can't afford to stay home, and they're handling your food. Does that make any economic sense? Absolutely not. I love getting on talk radio and bringing up that point, because I haven't found anyone yet who has a good comeback to why that's a good thing for our economy. Um, so uh, university education, um, you know, it's much less expensive in Europe. Some countries, it's still free. And you know, in the US, as, as many of you know, you're going to graduate tens of thousands of dollars in debt, unless you happen to be independently wealthy. So you're going to start out your career with a significant uh, debt. And um, so on and on and on, you know, Europe has basically taken the wealth that their economy produces. And they produce a lot of wealth. And they've plowed it into these sorts of things. And this, of course, is what um, is referred to as the welfare state. And you know, as we know, as Americans, in America, the term welfare is not a very nice term. It's a big red flag saying that this is somehow a, a bad thing. And so, and, and, I, and I remember in doing the interviews for this book and asking people about this, at one point there was a, um, a British uh, analyst who said to me, you know, this really is not welfare as you Americans understand that term. This is about how do you support families and individuals and workers so that they can go to work and be healthy and productive. It's about good, having good workers. That's what these supports are about. It's not about people kicking back on the dole like we think of when we think of welfare in the United States. And so in my book, I actually call it the European workfare system because it's about working. It's not about what we Americans think of as welfare. And that's an important um, distinction to, to underline. Um, in many ways, Europe has come up with a way to really enact family values. In America, you hear a lot of politicians saying a lot, talking a lot about family values. But I actually have a quote in my book from a conservative politician in Europe, a, 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 a Danish uh, politician. And he said, you know, you in America, you like to talk a lot about family values, but we actually put money behind it. And, you know, uh, and the type of things I'm talking about is, you know, as I said, paid parental leave. When you have a child, you, there's a feeling there that it's a job to stay home and take care of that child, give that child a good start in life. You can't take away people's wages and expect that they're going to stay home with that child. You all, in Europe, in, in, uh, in, in just about every country that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, they also get what's called a kitty stipend, um, where for every child you have, you get about $150 to $200 a month for things like diapers and uh, baby bottles and all the things you need. And you have that up until the child turns 18. Um, and you get this, you know, poor families get it, middle class families, wealthy families get it. It's universal. Everybody gets it. And they can afford it because they've taken the wealth of their society and they decided that this is the values, this is where we think is going to produce the, the healthiest workers, the healthiest families in order to, um, to make our society work. They also have, you know, depending on the country, five to six weeks paid vacation. They have holidays for Catholic saints you've never heard of. You know, all sorts of holidays. Every little hilltop town in Italy or Spain or Germany or wherever has their own little holiday for, for different, different saints. And so um, now it's just, you know, in America, our, on average, we have um, two weeks paid vacation and not nearly as many holidays. And in fact, America is one of the few countries in the world that does not have a law requiring mandatory paid vacation for its workers. There are Americans working full-time jobs at jobs do not, that do not give them any paid vacation. And there's all sorts of research out there, again, that shows that well-rested workers, workers who feel like uh, you know, they're not worn out, those are better workers. They're more productive workers. So again, our, in many ways, our approach is just penny-wise and pound-foolish, as, as, uh, as it has been said, because it, it, it has blowback in certain ways. Now, the American response is to say, OK, 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 Europeans have all that, of course. but you know, they pay a lot of taxes uh, for that kind of thing. And here in no taxation without representation America, Americans would never put up with that so you can forget about it. So I began to look into that a little bit. Are, are, are Europeans really paying more taxes 
than, than we are. And, and, and once you look into it, get beyond the, the bumper sticker or slogans that sometimes passes for policy discussions, you realize that that's not true either. Because if you're an American paying escalating health care premiums, Anthem Blue Cross just recently announced an increase of up to 40% in health care premiums. Americans are paying, on average, twice as much money per capita for health care as someone in France or Britain or Sweden or Germany or any of these other countries. And all the metrics show we're getting worse health in health care, even though we're paying twice as much money. Um, if you're an American paying um, uh, child care, average uh, family with two children in America pays at least $12,000 a year for child care. Some countries in Europe, child care is free. And it's better quality because they don't have these decentralized hodgepodge systems where you know, you're not quite sure who, you know, the household that you're dropping your child off in. There's no uh, really system for keeping track of the quality of care. It's just word of mouth. In, in, in France and Sweden and other places, they have child care where it's uh, some places I say it's free. Others that you're paying um, a, a certain amount of money uh, per child, depending on what your income level is, maybe a thousand, uh, some as much as fifteen hundred dollars uh, a, a month. So, um, uh, excuse me, a year. So Americans are paying at least six, seven, eight times more for childcare, and in some cases quite a bit more, twelve times than, than other places are are, are paying for their childcare, and the quality is not as good. Um, if you're looking at things like I mentioned, university education. In many countries in Europe, it's still free. Some are paying a few hundred dollars more in tuition. Here, you're paying you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year. Um, re uh, retirement. The average retirement pension, government pension in France, Germany, Sweden, Britain, other countries, on average, you're going to be getting about two-thirds to three-quarters of your final salary in a retirement pension. Here in the United States, Social Security pays about 35%. So, you know, in some places, half of what they're getting. And that's why Americans are so obsessed with stuffing our IRAs and 401ks and trying to save as much as we can um, out of pocket because the Social Security is, is, uh, is, 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 is not enough to live on. And um, you know, I can give numerous examples like this. Um, senior care. Americans are paying three times as much out of pocket for senior care as Europeans are. And so when you boil it all down, what you realize that yeah, Europeans are paying more in taxes. Most countries are, not all, actually. But we're paying a lot more out of pocket to receive the things that they're getting in exchange for their taxes. We're paying a lot more for health care, a lot more for retirement, all these sorts of things in order for us to have a good standard of living. Now, if you're an American critic of the European way, you say, OK, OK, that's, that's true. But in America, we allow you to keep your own money. We allow you to put, the, you know, no, the government's not taking the money out of your pocket. You get to decide for yourself which of these services you want to buy, right? And that was the, uh, you know, George, uh, President uh, George W. Bush said this many times. This was part of his conception of the ownership society. And there's certainly a degree of truth to that. But here's the thing to think about. Is health care discretionary today? Is uh, a decent retirement discretionary? Is, um, you know, child care, is that really discretionary? Or are these the things that families and workers and people need in order to um, have a good standard of living, good quality of life in this increasingly economically competitive age? And um, you know, there's there's certainly uh, the uh, the you know, when you look at a lot of the um, you know the the. The, the, what passes for analysis, comparative analyses on taxes uh, from country to country, for the Forbes um, Tax Misery Index, as it's called, is one of the most authoritative. I mean, that's what a lot of people refer to. And yet Forbes only looks at income tax, uh, Social Security, or some sort of pension uh, tax, and things like sales tax and a few minor taxes. They're not looking at what are you getting in exchange for that, and what are you, who has to pay out of pocket in order to, um, to get those same services. And so that's why when you look at the Forbes Tax Misery Index, you see the European countries up there, most of them you know, at the top, the most tax miserable. And down there at the bottom, happy as a clam, around the Philippines and Malaysia, is the United States. Because we, um, we've taken this strategy of, of basically saying, we're not going to create these systems that are going to help families and individuals. And here's the interesting thing about that. 
because um, we don't create these pools of what I call social insurance to design and create a good childcare system, to create a good healthcare system, we end up paying more money as a result. That's why Americans are paying more for, you know, six times, seven, eight times more for childcare. That's why we're paying twice as much money per capita for healthcare, as, as well as other uh, reasons that I can, if I have time, I'll get into, but if not, we can talk about it in, in Q&A. So by, you know, by planning these things out ahead of time, instead of, you know, having these decentralized hodgepodge systems like we have healthcare, childcare, and others, you actually can create economies of scale and efficiencies that allows you to produce that service for less money. That's really key going forward. Because in many ways, um, you know, what our economy is going to be asked to do, what the European economy and every economy in the world going forward, as, as China and India and Brazil try to come to the table, we're going to be asked to do more with less. We're going to be asked to have more productivity, more labor productivity, more energy productivity, more productivity in our healthcare systems and social systems in order to be able to afford them. And so when we're spending six, seven, eight times more per capita for childcare, twice as much money per capita for healthcare, this is going to hurt our economy. Uh, American businesses, as they're trying to compete against global competitors, when they're paying more money per employee for healthcare, this makes them less competitive. So we're really going to have to address these things going forward. There's, there's, there's no question about it. Um, so how are we doing on time? 20 minutes? Pardon? Yeah, so you know, Anzing was going to tell me when I, how much do I have? Yeah, so how, how, 15 minutes left, okay. So, um, you know, how does Europe accomplish this? Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a subject of, well, of an entire book, but uh, I want to just give you a few um, things to think about, uh, institutions that I find quite impressive um, in Europe. Uh, one is, uh, if we look at Germany as an example, they have um, a practice there that's known as co-determination. What co-determination is, uh, you know, you have all these corporations out there, Fortune 500 companies, Germany has a lot of them with names that you probably would recognize like Volkswagen and BMW and Deutsche Telekom, Siemens, all these ones. And, you know, they're corporations just like we have in the United States. The difference is there, by law, the workers who work in these corporations get to elect 50% of the members of the boards of directors of these corporations. Think about that. Think about the, the ramifications of that. I, 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 let me ask, first of all, I like, I like to sort of get a poll sometimes. How many people in this audience have heard of these partially worker-elected boards of directors of major corporations? A few hands. That's more than I typically get, actually, in, in, uh, in most audiences in America. It would be as if, imagine if we had a law requiring that Walmart had to have its workers elect 50% of its board members. We kind of chuckle at that. We can't even imagine it in the American context, right? And yet if Walmart did that, it would change how they treat their employees. It would change how they treat the regions in which their stores are, uh, uh, reside. It would change how they treat their supply chain. This is what Germany has done. Um, Germany is the fourth largest national economy in the world. It's the world's largest exporter. Some people say China is, but I, I don't think you can trust China's numbers, so I still say uh, Germany is. Um, and, uh, and, and not only that, it's spread throughout Europe. In Sweden, the workers get to elect a third of the members of boards of directors. Um, and this kind of co-determination uh, means that the employers and the employees need to confer much more extensively with each other about all sorts of things. Now, the American response to this would be, well, that's going to hurt the competitiveness of both those companies as well as the uh, national economy. But look at, let's look at that. German, these German corporations, these are Fortune 500 companies. They're completely competitive. Some of them are leaders, global leaders in their field. Siemens, one of the, uh, the, the largest and most successful, most prop, uh, prosperous engineering and construction firms in the world. Same with the, you know, BMW, um, other, all these, uh, Mercedes, these are all German companies. Um, you, it's, uh, but it, it also means, though, that the, um, you know, when you have the workers having say in, in what's going on, that, uh, and they've done a lot of research on this, as you can imagine, but it helps to keep the company, everyone within the company, on the same page in terms of the challenges faced by that company 
and the prospective solutions. So it's actually an important component. And you know, again, uh, Germany's economy is right now actually in, 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 during the middle of this economic crisis, while our unemployment rate has just about doubled, in Germany, the unemployment rate has actually gone down. So you just can't argue that somehow this is going to make economies less competitive. Uh, the World Economic Forum actually does a rating of the most competitive national economies in the world. And, and regularly, six out of the top 10 slots are taken by European uh, countries, uh, most of whom are using this type of co-determination. All of them also use another feature called works council. At every job site, no matter how small, a works council is elected that has a, quite a bit of um, legal authority and power within that workplace to negotiate things like layoffs, um, you know, vacation, uh, you know, wages, all sorts of things. And taken together, these create much more of what I call a culture of consultation, where there's a lot more consultation going on in most of these countries. Not all of them. Some of them are, are, are certainly uh, gripped by uh, labor strife. Fran France is, um, is a good example. But France actually, uh, you know, contrary to the stereotype, only 8% uh, of France's private uh, employees are, are unionized. It really isn't a heavily unionized country, they, but they have even the average person just has a great deal of sense of labor solidarity. Um, so they, when there's strikes, everyone, you know, no one breaks the strike. It's amazing. But um, so these sorts of, um, you know, these sorts of techniques create this culture of consultation. And as a result of this culture of consultation during this economic crisis, Germany was able to adopt a, a strategy that proved to be not possible here in the United States. Instead of laying off millions of German workers, um, what they did was they had everybody cut back a little bit. So instead of working, say, 100%, you're working maybe 90% or 85% of, re of your regular hours. But during the good years, they were laying money aside. So if someone is, is working 85%, they're still getting maybe 90 or 95% of their pay. And by doing this, and this is, this is what uh, has been called short work, or in German, Kurzarbeit, by doing this, a few other good things happen. One, you keep more money in more people's pockets. So you don't get that downward spiral of consumer spending um, that I meant, talked about earlier. More people can, you know, they need that money, they spend it, and it keeps the, the downward spiral of the economic crisis from being too, too great. The second thing is it does is it keeps your workforce intact. So once the, um, the recovery comes, you're ready to go. Workers still have their skills. It hasn't deteriorated. Here in the United States, we have workers now that have been out of work for two years. Their skills have deteriorated. The mentality of getting up and going to work every day is not sharp anymore. And so you lose the, uh, the productivity of your workforce as a result of this. The third thing that, uh, that, uh, that short work does is it prevents the utter devastation that has happened in American communities when the main breadwinners are laid off. And what that, hap what that does to families, people losing their homes, foreclosed homes because they can't afford their payments anymore. Um, you know, increases in domestic violence, alcoholism, and all other types of social ills, all of which has gone on in this country. These countries in, in, in Europe, including Germany, the Netherlands, and others that have done this short work have been spared the worst, the most acute type of, of, of these sorts of, of problems. And yet when, Okay, and yet when uh, Larry Summers, who has been uh, one of President Obama's closest economic advisors until recently, was asked, well, you know, this German work, this German short work thing, it seems to be working pretty well over there. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we do something like that? His response was, well, here in America, we're not about protecting old jobs. We're about creating new jobs, as if there's some conflict between the two. And I, I think this really shows how, you know, in, Ger in, in Germany and Europe in general, they're much more pragmatic in their capitalism than we are here. In, 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 in here in the US, we, we seem to adhere to some fundamentalist playbook, capitalist playbook about how you're supposed to do these things. So when it comes to doing something like short work and preventing the foreclosures, preventing the social ills, keeping your workforce intact, um, you know, this economic fun fundamentalism kicks in and it says, no, no, we can't do that. But when it came to bailing out banks, and when it came to bailing out auto companies, suddenly they suspend their economic fundamentalism because that's not what you do in the capitalist playbook either, right? And so, you know, the question here is what, what, what's the correct way? What kind of pragmatism is going to work, really? Not whether you're adhering to something that was written by Joseph Schumpeter, you know, decades ago. Um, the other area in which 
Europe has really excelled, and I'll wrap up with this, and then we can open up to Q&A, uh, and, and in terms of addressing the, the global challenges I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is in the area of um, eco, eco, uh, environmental sustainability. You know, again, these are capitalist economies, and yet they have managed to lower their electricity use to the point where the average European uses half the electricity of the average American. The average European emits half the carbon of an average American. It takes 40% more fuel to go a mile in an American car than it does um, in, in a, a European car. Uh, they're they're impl implementing all sorts of interesting technologies, both renewable technologies as well as conservation technologies. Things like you know, the low wattage light bulbs, which you, can, you see a little bit more of in the United States. I don't know, we'll have to look. What do we have here? Do we have the low wattage light bulbs? I can't tell. Uh, but, you know, these low wattage light bulbs, they use, they get the same wattage, uh, the same power, the same luminosity for a fifth of the power. Motion sensors in buildings so that when the, uh, you know, no one's in the building, the lights go off. On elevators and on, uh, excuse me, on escalators. When no one's on the escalator, the escalator stops. Rotating doors, carousels on buildings. When no one's in the carousel, it stops. Um, and, you know, I don't know what it, I haven't looked here in Atlanta, but in San Francisco where I live, you can look downtown uh, at night and you can see all the buildings with the lights on. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. And all I have to do is put a motion sensor in, the, in all those buildings. You can even, if, if for some reason you're afraid a plane's going to smash into your building at night, you can bring it down to a certain level of dimness um, and, uh, and, and reduce the amount of power that's being used. Um, all our appliances today are always on. It's what's called standby power. You know, our stereos are always flashing on us, even when we're not using them. I have a toaster where, uh, you know, there's a light always on in my toaster. And you push the button down to make toast, and it does this thing where the light goes doo 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 I mean, Why do I need a light on my toaster? Do I think I need to make toast in the dark or something? <laughs> what is the point of that? It's supposed to attract me as a consumer, right? Well, this is what's called standby power. And in aggregate, it actually uses quite a lot of power. In the EU, they passed a, a regulation saying, telling manufacturers, you've got to bring your standby power of your appliances down to 10% of what it was. It's just, you know, this is not uh, government subsidized. It's just by passing a regulation that gives a signal to the manufacturers of, the, you know, what they have to do. Um, they're also doing amazing things with building design to decrease the carbon and energy footprint of buildings. I gave a talk at the Europe European Commission back in September, and it's a huge building, and, and the entire building is surrounded by what, what looks like you know, window blinds, except they're very big win window blinds. And these blinds just tilt um, as the day progresses and as the sun comes in or out it, to let natural sunlight in, both for warming purposes and for lighting purposes, so you can use less electricity for warming and, and lighting your building. Um, you know, doing other interesting designs like hermetically designed buildings, uh, her excuse me, hermetically sealed buildings where the air can't get in or out unless you let it. And as you let the air inside the building outside, you can exchange the heat that's in that air and give it off, sort of hand it off to the air coming in. So the air goes out, but the heat doesn't. And by doing this, you can heat uh, buildings. As, you know, one person was telling me, we can heat this building for the amount it takes to... Uh, to power a, um, a hair dryer. So these are sorts of um, building designs that are going on that are really quite impressive. Um, they're doing things like um, uh, combined heat and power. When you produce power at a power plant, about 40% of the energy used to produce that power is lost up the chimney flue as heat. It just is belched into the environment. Well, what the Europeans are doing is they're taking that heat, they're drawing it off and putting it into pipes and taking it into their villages and towns and buildings and homes and, and using it to heat. It's kind of like what you do in your car when you think about it. You know, your engine is producing heat. And, you know, that heat could just be belched into the atmosphere. Instead, it's stored in your engine in a certain place and you can draw that into your car to heat the car. That's basically what they're doing with their buildings with this huge amount of heat that's given off in, um, by, by power plants. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples is off the coast of Portugal. They have um, these things called sea snakes. They're about 300 feet long and about 25 feet in diameter, these big, huge tubes. And they just float in the ocean. And you can make grids of these things. They have pistons inside. And as they go up and down from the wave motion, they're producing power 24-7. Off the coast of Britain, you imagine taking a windmill, sinking it beneath the sea, and embedding it into the seafloor 
We're just churns in the currents 24-7. And of course, they're doing amazing things with the wind power and solar power and uh, not only creating big uh, electricity generating plants, but also putting solar panels on people's homes. In fact, in Germany, um, Spain, and Portugal, and elsewhere, they pass these things called feed-in tariffs where um, if you're a home producing power for yourself through solar panels, and you produce more than you need, you can, you can sell it back to the grid, and you get four times the amount of uh, money per kilowatt that you produce compared to standard um, power. So again, government isn't subsidizing this stuff. They're, using, they're doing it by regulating the private sector to things like feed-in tariffs and, and, and other uh, sorts of um, policies. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that um, Europe is doing, and I, and I should mention that they a lot of the technology, well, maybe not a lot, but certainly a, a, a number of them that were originally, that they're using there in an increasingly widespread fashion, originally were developed here in the United States, possibly even at schools here like Georgia Tech. And yet they've been able to implement these things way more than we've been able to do it here. In fact, a lot of American companies that have started, they go to Europe for their business because they, they can't get traction here because we don't have the correct policies uh, that gives them the... The, the, the ability to do that. So, and, and as a result of that, the, the, you know, the Germans and the, the Swedes and others, they've taken these technologies, perfected them to the point where they've now produced their own green industries that are creating hundreds of thousands of jobs, and they're exporting these technologies to China, India, Brazil, and emerging economies who want this technology and need it, and we need them to have it because we need them to lower their carbon emissions as well. So it, it, in many, many ways, uh, Europe is just really at the forefront of these sorts of things, and we, ha we haven't been doing nearly enough to take advantage of what really should be our home field advantage in developing a lot of these original technologies. Uh, so, uh, you know, why don't we uh, pause there and go into Q&A, and, and uh, I'd be happy to entertain other ideas. And I do go into some of the problems that Europe is having, including on things like uh, population decline and immigration and such, and so if that's of interest, I'd be glad to, to talk about that. So whatever you want to talk about, uh, let's let's do it. Hey, you briefly mentioned at the very end uh, innovation uh, and how sort of the technologies that were made in America are sort of being applied over uh, in the European area. Do you think if we were to implement sort of a European economic viewpoint in the future, like sort of stuff that you're talking about, that innovation in America would uh, be hindered because uh, I feel like it could be, but there are ways that we could sort of uh, prevent you know innovation from totally being kicked out. But I think it's pretty important thing to think about. What do you think? Well, I think the reason why we ha are are playing catch up um, now, um, I mean we can trace it historically, but in terms of right now, there's no question that President Obama intended to go further in this area than he's. Um, been able to. And um, I mean, for example, President Obama, uh, for the first time, we, um, it, we actually have a, a line item in the federal budget now for high speed rail. We never had a line item specifically for high speed rail. And that was only because of President Obama, because during the, uh, the, the stimulus money in the spring of 2009, uh, you know, they were going back and forth in Congress, and, and the money for high speed rail kept getting cut, 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 cut. And at one point, uh, President Obama said to Rahm Emanuel, I want a transformative amount of money in this budget for high-speed rail. And as a result of that, we got $8 billion for high-speed rail, which is actually not that much money if you're really going to do it seriously, but it's way more than we ever had before. So President Obama clearly wants to go more in this direction. The problem he has run into is the buzzsaw of uh, a filibuster gone wild Senate. Um, at this point, you know, no one ever thought that we would need 60 out of 100 votes to get anything done in the Senate. Usually, you know, you need a majority, 51 out of 100. And the filibuster suddenly came along. I mean, to give you a perspective on what this, uh, you know, the filibuster, is everyone familiar with what I mean by the filibuster, where in order to cut off debate in the Senate, you need 60 out of 100 votes to cut off a bit debate and then vote on a bill. And once you cut off debate, you can vote on the bill, and it only takes 51 out of 100 votes to, win, to pass that bill. But to cut off debate, you need 60 out of 100. And you know, the filibuster was meant as a tool to slow down uh, bills in the Senate, to create a more deliberative body, to create some sort of consensus formation process. 
But for example, in the 1960s, during a very tumultuous time of civil rights era, uh, the filibuster was used maybe a half a dozen times a year. And since then, we've seen an increasing use of the filibuster. But in, the, in this Congress, the filibuster is basically being used for every piece of legislation that comes uh, to, into the Senate. And as a result of this, it has completely stymied what uh, Obama wanted to do on health care, on gl uh, global climate issues, uh, on a whole range of issues. And so going forward, this is going to be a big problem. And I, can, I, I can't think of any other legislatures around the world where you need a s close to a supermajority, um, except for one, California state legislature, where you need two thirds to, uh, to change any of the revenues. And as a result, this led to a tremendous amount of paralysis in California. So two, you know, super majorities are just a bad thing to, as a regular practice. There are certain, there are only seven times in the U.S. Constitution where it calls for a supermajority vote. They, they, the founders were very precise in knowing that two thirds is just simply too high. But through a quirk of history, we've developed this filibuster that is not in the Constitution. It's just a rule of the Senate. It's not even a law that's created it. And now we need 60 out of votes, 100 votes to get anything done. This is a big problem, and it's not going to change. Yes, anytime soon. I mean, it will change eventually. Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering, uh, the EU has come very far when it comes to green energy. Uh, and to encourage this development, they have, for example, raised taxes on petrol, etc. And I wonder, do you even think that is applicable here in the US? I'm from Sweden, so we're kind of used with a little bit higher taxes. But I wonder, do you even think it's possible since ta raising taxes might not be as acceptable in the US as in the EU? Um, certainly, Americans are more tax averse. But I think part of that is, is just education. Um, as I said, you know, you ha we have the stereotype that somehow Europeans pay more taxes than we do. And yet, when you really do the, the balance sheet of what you get for what you pay, it turns out Americans are paying out just as much as Europeans. We're just getting a lot less for our money. And when it comes to things like uh, green taxes, um, I think the case needs to be made uh, that um, the, by taxing things like gasoline, um, it actually forces the auto companies to come up with more fuel efficient cars. It actually increases the productivity and innovation of your industry uh, because they, uh, you know, they're going to be sensitive to consumer demand. And whichever company comes up with the more fuel efficient car is going to get more business. And you clearly see that in Europe, where these, the higher taxes force the industries to become more fuel efficient and more innovative. Um, again, this is something that I think Obama wanted to look at more seriously. And because of this filibuster uh, gone wild Senate, it's, it's proven to be difficult to do. And uh, so until we resolve these political issues, things like raising taxes on, on gasoline to create these more efficiencies within the development of the technologies and stuff is, is going to be difficult in the current political climate. Yes, if, um, if the US does decide to enact the, the concepts and the policies of Europe, how long do you think it, it will take for, for us to actually see the benefits of the, of the things you discussed? Well, it depends on the policy. I mean, you know, we could pass a law right now for paid sick leave. And every, the 60 million American workers that currently don't have it would immediately have access to it. Um, you know, we could, um, uh, you know, some of these things could be passed and Americans would immediately experience. I mean, even the Obama, the, the Obama health care plan, which is, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but it's a small step. Um, and if anyone's asked me a question about that, I'll answer it in, uh, in more in depth. But, you know, for example, it, it has said that, um, you know, that children now or young adults can be covered on their parents' insurance up to 26. Instead, it used to be 21. So immediately had an impact for those, for those people who are between the ages of 21 and 26. So, you know, some policies, what you pass them, you, you see immediate impacts. Others will take more time. When you start talking about developing things like high-speed rail or uh, developing the, um, the, the um, electricity grid, we don't, we don't have a nationwide grid, and that's why you can't really, you don't see regions of the US that have a, a surplus of power able to pass it on to regions that have a decrease, uh, a, a deficit of power. And, and so that's why a few years ago in California, we saw this huge spiking of what Californians were paying for electricity and for power uh, because of the, uh, the, the grid didn't allow that. And it allowed 
companies like Enron to basically game the system um, and to charge California exorbitant rates for electricity. So, I mean, some of those things are going to take more time. But, you know, we can't be discouraged by that. I mean, you know, America is a country that is never shirked from challenges. Uh, we have taken on challenges that take many years. And there's a lot of discussion now about deficits, and we've got to reduce our deficits. And certainly deficits are important, but you have to also look at, think about that another name for a deficit is investment. If you're spending money on good things that are going to improve your country for the future, that's a wise thing to do. And a, di a previous generation of American leaders understood that. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're investing things like healthcare, I mean, there's no question we're spending 17% of our GDP on healthcare. Over the long term, the current cost of healthcare is going to bankrupt our country. And, um, and so if we don't do something about it, we're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, so investing in a way that's going to uh, allow us to address this is, is just a smart thing to do. But you have to spend money today sometimes in order to, to, to get the benefits tomorrow, you know, tomorrow or 20 years from now. And so it's really a matter of what you're spending your money on. If you're spending a trillion dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that may not be the best use of the money considering some of the other needs of, the, of, of our country right now. Hey, um, I kind of wanted to go back to what you said for your first answer to a question, and you were talking about how a lot of times in European legislatures, they're actually able to pass legislation and pass laws that can are implemented rather quickly compared to the United States and our filibustering techniques and the polarization between the two major parties. And I was wondering if it's significant to you in the European Union and European countries that there are multi-party systems as opposed to the US and the two major parties. And if that's significant, how could the, U the United States uh, foster a more multi-party system? It's an excellent question. Um, could everyone hear, she was asking, whether the fact that Europe has a multi-party system, um, has that allowed them to adopt some of these things? And, uh, and I actually have two chapters in the book comparing the political systems of the United States to uh, various European countries. There's no question that this is part of um, our challenge, is that before we can even enact some of these things, we have to significantly reform our political system. Um, you know, right now, uh, you know, we have this two-party system where uh, you know, it's me against you. And I can win as easily by driving voters away from you as by attracting them to me. In fact, it's easier in a campaign to drive voters away from you than it is to attract them to me. So that means I don't try to take stands on issues. And when I do, I, my stands are, are predicated on the polls and focus groups I've run in order to uh, figure out, because every close election is, is decided by a small group of voters called swing voters, right, And it is in the American system. And as one political consultant has defined swing voters, they're the voters that are least interested uh, in, and know the least about the issues. And if you don't grab them in eight seconds with your sound bite that slashes and burns, you've lost them. So these are the people deciding the close elections. And those close elections decide who has control of the House of Representatives and the Senate and all these sorts of things. So the, 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 the architecture of our political system dumbs down the debate, where it becomes harder to have uh, discussions in a way that fleshes out the, the importance of these issues. Uh, and um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is, uh, you know, we don't even have universal voter registration, uh, automatic voter registration like they have in Europe. Everyone who's 18 and eligible to vote is automatically registered to vote. We also don't have other things like public financing of campaigns or free media time for candidates and parties. So as a result, your, your ability as a candidate or party to reach voters is dependent on the amount of money you can raise privately. And in order to raise enough money, you've got to go to certain sources that have that money that are going to have certain restrictions on what they want you to talk about. So you can't have the open and debate and discussion of ideas. In, in Europe, they have um, another thing that's crucially important, and it's a different electoral system. Instead of electing one district at a time, which is sometimes called the winner-take-all electoral system, um, where it has these dynamics I described, uh, you know, I mean, we used to think of our system as a two-party system, Democrats and Republicans. But in fact, we can tell you who's going to win uh, about 90% of the seats in the next election in Congress, 2012. Because most of these districts are so lopsided, either Democrat or Republican, 
that there's no chance for the other side to win. I live in San Francisco. Nancy Pelosi is my representative. There's no chance for a Republican to win in San Francisco. There's just not enough Republicans there. Um, so, and this is how most districts are in the United States. And as a result of that, without that competition, you don't have debate and discussion of ideas. Um, it means the frame of reference for most voters where they live is not even of a two-party system. Your choice in the American system is to ratify the candidate of the party that dominates your district. That's your choice. That's the type of choice that, that the Politburo in the Soviet Union used to offer to, to Soviet citizens. That's not choice. Whereas in Europe, they have uh, what's called proportional representation, where uh, if a party wins 5% of the vote, 8%, 10% of the vote, instead of getting nothing like you get in this system, you get that percentage of the seats. You'll get 5% of the seats, or 8%, or 10% of the seats. If you get 55% um, of the vote, instead of getting 100% of the representation, you get 55% of the seats. And so this is what creates multi-party democracy, uh, these different uh, different structures. Um, and as a result of that, I mean, using the, the Green Party as just one example, uh, some of you may have followed the recent German elections just this past weekend in one uh, state election, a, a area that the Christian Democrats, the conservatives, have won consistently for six decades. The Greens are going to be leading the government. And, and uh, because the Green Party started as a small party, and small parties in the United States actually start at the same rate that they do in countries in Europe, but they, in the U.S. they quickly die because you need so much, uh, such a high percentage of vote in order to get in the legislature. But in, the, in Germany, Sweden, uh, France, uh, excuse me, not France, um, other countries in Europe, they, the Green parties and the smaller parties could start small and build. And they got, the, the Green Party has grown over several decades to the point where now positions they used to take on the environment, like sustainability, uh, carbon, um, lowering carbon emissions, those used to be fringe positions. They're now mainstream politics. All the parties, even the conservative parties in Europe, um, have to have positions on these that are actually quite green by American standards. So there's no question that having a political system where you can have robust public debate, where money doesn't play as big a role in terms of being able to reach voters, and where um, you can have multi-party democracy, different points of view. I mean, look, this is, we're, spo we're supposed to believe in the free marketplace, right? That's what America is supposed to be about. And yet, when it comes to our politics, there is no free marketplace. You've got a, two choices, and as I said, for most people where they live, um, sometimes entire states, their governor, their two senators, all the statewide offices, and members of Congress are all come from a single party. You have these monocultures that have developed here, and it's not a good, a good thing. So, other questions? We have time for one final question. Uh, yes, you mentioned a lot of really interesting policies that the United Can States... speak up a little bit? I'm having trouble here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, you've mentioned a lot of interesting policies that the United States can implement. Um, my question is, what, what single thing do you think is most important, um, and what's our first step and why? What was the last part? What is our first step that we can take to implement these policies? Well, the first step is, is always the best one. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, certainly political reform is important in order to start making some of these other changes. But some of these other changes don't have to wait. I mean, you can start doing some of these things at local, the local level. I mean, here in, in Atlanta, the city council could pass efficiency standards telling all these, these big skyscraper buildings that they have to have motion sensors in the buildings, they have to have low wattage light bulbs. I mean, I, I walked by some beautiful buildings. I went up to the art museum earlier today and walked back along uh, West Peachtree, and I don't know what buildings they were, but some beautiful uh, 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 skyscrapers. And some of them have glass on the outside. You know, every one of those panes could be a solar panel. And it would be producing power. I mean, this huge, you got this huge vertical structure sticking up from the ground that could be uh, 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 producing all sorts of power. And the city council just needs to pass a law um, saying that you know, for future buildings, you, uh, you're going to have to do things like this. Um, and you know, the, 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 all the evidence shows and the studies show that the initial costs are a, a bit higher, but not huge, uh, hugely uh, uh, more. But as a result, uh, you pay this off over time. And, and you end up with these businesses that over time will save uh, money and make them more competitive globally if, they, if they're involved in global markets at all. Uh, so, you know, these are the sorts of things that you can do right here at the local level and not wait for Congress. Um, I don't know. You know, it's uh, 
form yourselves into groups and start um, brainstorming these ideas. I mean, there's a lot of ideas in Europe's Promise. So oh, there's one you can do, buy Europe's Promise, self-promotion. Uh, but, but seriously, you, know, you can form yourself into local groups where you come up with ideas that you push forward. I mean, San Francisco, for example, passed a law requiring um, all businesses to uh, have paid sick leave for their employees. They also required businesses that don't give health care. Um, they have to pay into a fund, and workers can become part of a program that's called Healthy San Francisco, where they can, get, they can tap into the San Francisco um, health care that's pr provided for city employees. So you can do a lot of these things at the local level and not wait for the national government or for even for state government to move forward. I mean, Atlanta probably in certain ways, demographically, is probably more progressive than the rest of the state. Am I right about that? Probably, by quite a lot, I'll bet. Um, so some of it may have to start here and show that you can make it work here. And then when the other people out in the rural areas think, realize, wow, everyone who works in Atlanta has health care and I don't? What's that about? That becomes a model. And that becomes a model for other cities to copy because if, if you show you can do it, then they know that they can do it as well. So you know, every journey stops, starts with the first step. So form yourself into groups. You have to organize. We have a lot of work to do in this country. But, and, and all of you also can be sort of ambassadors because you all know people. You have family. You have friends. Uh, you know, tell them you saw a talk about how uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on in other countries. I mean, Japan is doing a lot of these things, too. It's not just Europe. Canada is doing some of these things. Australia, and, and really, in many ways, in, here in the US, we're the outlier. As I said, we're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have paid sick leave, doesn't have paid parental leave. And the other countries are like, you know, impoverished countries in Africa that don't have these things. So we're the outlier. Start it here, start it local, push these things, you can do it. Just, uh, you know, organize yourselves into groups and work with, I mean, being students here, you have access to resources that, let me tell you, when you graduate, you won't have access to. You know, you can maybe approach, approach a professor as doing a, a project for your class where you try to pull together some of your fellow students to um, approach the city council about having mandatory paid sick leave for every worker in Atlanta. Here's a project for you right there. Thank you. Thank you.